Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz drummer Jeff Tane Watts. His last CD was 2016's Blue Volume 2, and there is more coming on the way. He was born in Pittsburgh and went on to learn music at the Berklee College of Music. He has appeared as both a musician on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno and as an actor, Rhythm Jones and Spike Lee's Mo' Better Blues. From there, he's collaborated with Branford Marsalis, Danilo Perez, Michael Brecker, Betty Carter, Kenny Kirkland, and so many others. He was the 2017 Guggenheim Fellow in the field of music composition, and he is a very interesting cat with a lot of stories. So get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Jeff, thank you for taking a minute out today. I appreciate it. That was cool. Let me get kind of to the my first question here is to kind of generically, what has been going on with you lately musically? I don't know. I spend more time at home. Um, not truly in anybody's band, although... I'll, you know, I mostly play with friends, like I just did some stuff with Kevin Eubanks last week. I spend a lot of time at home, and I just write a lot of music, and I'm just trying to get better. So your last album was was Blue Volume 2 in 2016. Do you have anything else on the horizon, anything else coming out, any other collaborations or solo work? Yeah, there'll be uh, at least uh, one or two studio recordings during this calendar year. Also, I have a uh, trio recording that was done live in Amsterdam this past February, or a guitar trio. And then, I th- you know, I have a couple of projects, like large ensemble projects that I'm writing for. That, you know, if they're, they'll, they'll be out within a year from now, I would say. So, it, I mean, it's going to, yeah, I mean, it's a lot, you know, because my recordings tend to be original music, but I, but, um, I just write all the time, and it's, and it's fun. So how does a kid from Pittsburgh grow up to become so prolific in the world of jazz? I guess there's always kind of like a back and forth with the music, like between, uh, you know, times of experimentation and then times when people come together just to try to define what's going on and stuff like that. But um, I don't know. I just felt like whenever I went to college, um, there were a lot of uh, young musicians that were inquisitive about the roots of the music, so I just came up with a lot of good people and uh, played with some, some you know, very rare talents, and uh, you know, and I've been able to to sustain and and try to contribute to the music. Before we get to the college years, I want to know what albums did you listen to growing up, jazz albums specifically that really swayed you hard? Oh, just something like um. Headhunters or, or you know, who gets to our Black and the Jazz Messengers or, uh, you know, I mean, I was I was kind of into the Mob Easter Orchestra, so I would say something like uh, Visions of the Emerald Beyond or, you know, I mean, there was, there, was, there was a certain amount of fusion in there and then I got into Max Roach's music. You can say Coltrane's music as a body of work and Monk's music, you know. I used to get into the Art Ensemble Chicago and, you know, I mean, it could be anything, though. It could be a great Earth, Wind & Fire recording like Spirit or, or I Am. Or, I mean, all in all, I mean. Um, it could be uh, Stevie Wonder's Talking Book. It could be, the, um, you know, Band of Gypsies by Jimi Hendrix. I mean, those are, you know, recorded us. I, I know I, I spent a lot of time with even before I considered being a professional musician. I wanted to kind of go into what you were talking about with college, about your experiences there, and I was curious... What did you learn in a formal environment about music that helped you as a professional? Well, it's more about relationships than actual stuff. I mean, I mean, at, at the end of the day, in in performance, at least you're 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 making decisions. You know, you're just like trying to decide how to orchestrate something on your instrument and making choices about dynamics and how and how it feels um, emotionally across the band. You know. If you're if you're assisting the environment with um, being comfortable enough to be open and creative, you know, so um, that's that's more of a feeling. So I mean, the experience gained was cool. Um, you know, I, I guess it was pretty early in in the jazz education game. You know, I mean, now there's a lot of uh, schools that that offer a focus in jazz or improvised music or commercial music. You know, I, I would say it's Geometric exponentially more, you know. But I guess when I when I was going to college, when I transferred from the conservatory, 
to uh, Berkeley, there were maybe like four places to go. Yeah, so you have uh, coming together of people, different cultures, different backgrounds. Um, you know, you know more more European musicians coming over with their perspective, and uh, you know just people from different parts of the country. I bet I met Bradford Marcellus in college. Yeah. You know, you know he's from New Orleans, and that's this is how they get down. And I find out what materials they had access to when whenever they were in high school. You know, you know, before college, or someone like Frank Lacey from Houston, Texas. You know, you know, a lot of different people. It's a snapshot of what the average collegiate person that has like some some area, you know, speciality or focus. You know what I mean? If I'm going to law school, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a, get deep as deeply into law as I can, but also I'm gonna get a, a you know regional feelings from people from different parts of the world. Just being in a college environment, um, yeah. I hope I answered your question. You did absolutely. So I'm curious about Wenton and Branford Marsalis. What did you learn from them in your formative years with their rich family history and heritage and all of that experience? Oh, what did I learn from them? Well, Branford went to college with me, so I, I, I think that the, the one of the main things is, I mean, you kind of have to split your head up. You know, because you're, you know, dealing with this music, you you are you are responsible for, you know, whatever percentage of of tradition and and things like that. You know, or, you know, just just the weight of, of of being a musician. You know, it's such a privilege, and you want to you want to do your best for for yourself and and for the music. So you know, you, there's a there's a point where you're always humbled to the music and always a student, but also just the um, you know, they they themselves, I guess, would admit now that as even though they came from a very jazzy environment, just as far as uh, some of the intricacies of, of performing this music, of course, we all learn about them later from repetition, from talking to, to older musicians. You know, so I would just say that um, about them specifically, when you aspire in your heart to to to, to deal with the music on a serious level, then you. You're already you you achieve something. You know what I mean. So you know that you, that this is what you want to do, and you carry yourself. You know, if you're an aspiring painter, you carry yourself like a painter. And that's I mean, I feel like um, in addition to instrumental stuff and and things that they had together, um, they're you know they had a very strong self belief, and that carried them as as much as as talent and, and stuff like that. You know. It's like you you aspire to to this life, and so therefore you you are that, even though you are still an apprentice. You know, it's 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 kind of esoteric. So, along with being a pretty prolific performer, you're also very very deep in the composition world. You're a 2017 Guggenheim Fellow uh, Award winner. How do you juggle both of those? How do you juggle the playing and performing and the composition? Do they go together? naturally or do you really have to kind of focus on both separately i guess one helps the other naturally and uh, a percentage of some of my writing is an extension of um concepts that come upon that playing so i mean so of course they intersect there's always going to be some some um some other material outside of my instrument that i need to inject you know so you know so i mean um I'm always going to be trying to apply some 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 things rhythmically to to make people feel a certain way, trying to use rhythm like harmony. But then there's there's going to be lyrical material that I that I need to just uh, acquire it. If it's if it's from Brazilian music, or it's from from opera or anything, you know, just anything with with soul. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's always I'm, I'm you know I. I, I learn things from from jazz. I learn things just from from birds. You know, <laughs> just anything. You know, any, anything that has that has a has a song and a purpose and makes you feel a certain way. So, Absolutely. You know, yeah. Yeah. So you, the industry really digs you. You've won enough awards over your career to say that you've won a lot. Is there an award that you won that surprised you the most? Not a favorite one, but one that you just didn't expect. I don't know. There maybe the maybe the you know I got a couple of modern drummer awards. You know, I, I don't. I, I'm a you know I'm a I'm a drummer, but I'm not a drummy drummer. I'm just kind of like a 
a colorful guy, and I, I just like to play. And, and uh, you know, my focus is not on being amazing, I'll tell you that. So so to get a little more from, from my drumming peers, you know, the drum world, like the guitar world, can sometimes lean towards the kind of corny music store mentality or something like that, and just things that are effective on their own, but not necessarily in conjunction with musicians. So perhaps the the first one of those surprised me, but um, I, I mean I appreciate anybody that's listening enough to even <laughs> to even care. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, like um, so, like I was talking with a friend the other night. And they were like, yeah, you got to do you know, you you're gonna you're gonna do this and you can you know blah blah blah. I know some agents and some people they can you know put your name out there and blah blah blah. And I was just like. Man, I'm famous enough. I'm like, I don't have this little thing and that, and I do it on television, and I've been in movies, and blah, blah, blah. I'm famous enough. I just want to be good. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's what's up with me. So. so speaking of, you know, being on TV and being in film and, and kind of going down that route, that's greater exposure for you. Has that been something that you've consciously wanted to gravitate towards, or has it just happened in the natural rhythm of your career? All this stuff kind of comes my way, but um. Actually, the film thing, I had, you know, I tell people that it was kind of funny, but I, I had recorded the soundtrack already to Mo Better Blues, and I was about to be hired as a consultant to teach an actor how to appear to play the drums. And, you know, uh, Spike Lee asked me at a, at a New York Knicks game, and so I said I would do that. And then I found out that in, in the interim that they decided to just get a real drummer because the drums are so visual. And uh and it was would be difficult to teach an actor. So then they actually auditioned like drummers all over New York and all over Chicago and didn't find anybody. It came back to me. So it's good. so that was unusual. <laughs> so yeah, so I ended up in you know, I'm in this film and I'm at rehearsing with Denzel Washington and all these people. And most of the things that happened to me, I I just kinda of step outside of them and just laugh at because it's kinda of surreal, you know. But um yeah, but I ended up there. I had, I actually had billing over Samuel L. Jackson in this film, which is hilarious to me. But um, yeah. <laughs> generically, as somebody that's dedicated your life to jazz, why do you love jazz? Um, you know, I just, I, I just whenever I'm out in New York, I'm, I, I just wanted to work, you know, and just to be able to sustain myself because uh, my, 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 you know, my family were were working people and people that. You know, would pro- probably rather I stayed in Pittsburgh at the time, but um, you know, it's like my you know my brothers mostly stayed in the state and stayed about the Pittsburgh area, and so just the concept of, of being a professional musician was was yeah, and it is some crazy outer space mess. It's like it's it's foreign to most people what it truly entails, and and that's why you have to be patient with bizarre questions that people ask you at their gig. But um, yeah, I was just preparing myself for anything when I when I was at school, and it's 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 cool. And the gang would have called me. I mean, you know, I love the music and everything like that. But I was just, you know, I would have been satisfied playing with Earth, Wind, and Fire, or whatever. But still, the the knowledge and the uh, you know knowing that it was created here and the the role of African Americans is a source of pride, and of course, of for the formal years of of American music and stuff like that. Um. You know, it's yeah. There must be something about it because everybody everybody wants to get down with it. You know, it's kind of like yeah. a guy could sell like five hundred billion records, but he wants to, something in the back of his mind is like, man, I just want to mess up, mess this whole thing up, and just play some jazz. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> there's there's something about it. It's like you know. This, what do you want? You want to do some like seventy five dollar games or something like that? You want to, do <laughs> like, you want to, you know, you want to get a band menu? Is that what you're crazy? No, <laughs> I love <laughs> or, it. Or drink tickets or something. What are you looking for? But no, but it, but it's true. And I just find all these artists they just want to, you know, to the point where now, um, just the the jazz thing. I have to I have to laugh at. Not at the name itself or what it what it what the core of it truly is, but I have to just laugh at um, how it's thrown around. And I, you know, now I just kind of associate it with 
adult entertainment or something like that. And my, you know, as opposed to the the you know the specific lineage of classic jazz or anything like that. It's, you know, because jazz festivals, it's like retro rock and roll or anything or world music or many many things are are just interchangeable. So I just feel like when something is marketed as jazz now, it's kind of like everything except Justin Bieber will be here. But maybe in yeah. 10 years he'll be here. But everything except, you know, Lady Gaga could be here. You know, yeah. she's jazzy now. You know, but it's it's, it's just anything with a, a more adult taste, hopefully, you know, from how, however people are marketing it. You know, it could be, of course, like gospel. It could be anything. It could be a lot of things now. Yeah, you know, just as, just as far as what the public perceives, you you could just tell somebody to you know put some bongos on on something and tell them it's bad. Yeah, you know? but it's I mean it's cool in, it's cool in one way, but it's, you know just the the usage of the name. I don't know if I don't know if they should come up with more names and more subgenres or something like that. You know, it's you know people come up with their very personal music and it, maybe. It, might have improvisation in it, it might not, but it doesn't matter. They just they say that's what it is, so that's what it is, you know. But um, yeah, yeah, just like on a, a more they should call it tasty adult music. <laughs> I think you're honest, Tom. I think you're yeah. definitely honest. Tom. Diversify yeah. the name. I dig it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, speaking of crowds and what people want, what's one of the nicest things a fan has ever said to you about your music? It's usually something like love related or something, you know. I, I mean, those, you know, some people will tell me they, whatever, they had a good evening with each other, you know, after, after my gig or something like that. I was just embarrassed and it was just like, you know, I was playing there and playing something, you know, and I guess it was a couple they were just waiting. And then they just started making out. It was the greatest compliment in the world. I was just like, yeah. this is what it's all about right here. This is what's all right. Yeah, just say, whether that's from being comfortable or being whatever, you know, whatever it took to get to that, I'm glad it happened around me, you know. but That's um, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So let me ask you this. Everyone has a perception of who you are, your family, your friends, and your fans. But when you wake up and face the world, who do you think you are? You're gonna find me right now. <laughs> when I wake up, I get this. What time? <laughs> Hi. Man, that could sound brutal. Hey, hey, sweetie. Hey, I love you. Have fun. <laughs> that's that's timing, man. Forever. That's that's <laughs> perfect timing. Wow, I couldn't have set that up any better. That was yeah, that's right. <laughs> there you go. Happy yeah. is right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah, that's about it. You know, and I was, I was telling somebody the other day, it was like, this. what was it? It's like, you know, this young family thing, music and stuff like that or whatever. And um, one of the hippest things is that it gives me a, a selfless motivation to to improve instead of I want to be better so I can be a, the, the king of the music and the blah 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 or play everything and you know and I just I want to be better for them so it, so I can do it and it's not selfish or anything it's cool it's like solid yeah what I do yeah that's cool that's purpose that's a beautiful way to wrap everything up Jeff thank you for taking a little time out for me today I appreciate it. Okay, well, I'll see you somewhere. Say hi to the cast down there. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Pittsburgh, Kansas City, New York, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Jeff for his time, his stories, and his honesty. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com, and for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.